Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom with our host, Bob Olson, who will now introduce today's show and speaker. WCAT Radio presents The Open Door. I have left an open door before you, which no one can close open to the love of God, open to joining his stream of love for others. And our panel today includes Dr. Rhonda Chervin, Catholic writer from Corpus Christi, Texas, Dr. Richard Garrity from Birmingham, Alabama, professor of philosophy at EWTN, writer of books about uh, Aristotle's ethics, Plato's Republic, who is writing a book about Blessed Cardinal Newman's apologetics. And uh, last but not certainly not least, Commander Al Hughes from Corpus Christi, Texas, colonel in the Air Force, a married father who converted to the church from being an agnostic, also has degrees in engineering and in pastoral studies. We go now to our leader, Commander Al. Thank you, Bob. If you uh, if you ask six people what is a church, you'd probably get six different answers. Uh, many years ago, uh, in the 1970s, Avery, Father Avery Dulles wrote a little book, Models of the Church, in which he uh, gave six answers to that question, what is church? And we're going to discuss that, both the strengths and weaknesses of each model, if you will, uh, uh, of the church. It, the six are institution, community, sacrament, herald, servant, and a school of discipleship. So we'll run through those six and any others that uh, strike our fancy in the next hour. Uh, so panel, uh, the, let's start with the most obvious one, church seen as an institution, the strengths of that and the weaknesses of it. Oh, I have an immediate response. The word institution has become a negative word because of all these people who say, I don't like the institutional church, but I'm very spiritual just the same. See, it's used as a negative term, and it just occurred to me if you compare the jungle and the Wild West to countries now or places we live that have institutions, really. <laughs> Is institution so bad? You know? Uh, so, um, but we know what people mean when they think of it negatively. But starting with the positive, uh, being brought up as a total atheist by anti-communist, ex-communist, anti communist parents, we were brought up to think that anything institutional was negative, um, yet at the same time we never, my parents weren't logicians, so they never figured out that after all, since they wanted us to go to public school, that was an institution, they didn't want us to just sit at their feet and learn, which we probably would have liked very much. <laughs> because uh, they were both excellent teachers in different ways, but they weren't teachers. One was a, um, they were both editors rather than teachers. But in any case, when I found the church, I was thrilled that there was an institution where you could learn approved doctrines and truths and where there were beautiful sacraments and where there was a secure ruling body, it seemed to me extremely positive. Well, that, uh, that that's interesting. The uh, I remember either reading the book or, or hearing a lot about it in the 70s because it, it was somewhat of the rage. And uh, I was in the order, and most of us were cradle Catholics, not not many converts. And the way it was taken, and they call it the spirit of Vatican II, was that institutions uh, are bad, decrepit, 
uh, broken down oppressive. Now, this is, this is among cradle Catholics, uh, among, you know, uh, teachers uh, and educators. And that, that was the impression it left. And uh, everybody at the, uh, well, in my circle at the time, we were in for the prophetic church, you know, proclaiming uh, the truth uh, or, uh, often against the institutional or uh, you'd have the witnessing church or the people of God but an opposition was set up between the uh, institutional church and the rest and uh, and maybe that, that, that wasn't uh, Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Avery's intention but I mean that, that's the it was picked up and, and it was picked up with the spirit of Vatican II was rolling around. So you had a tremendously uh, anti institutional spirit in an order that, that's quite institutional and the church is quite institutional. And, and we had the rise of what this uh, one superior called it the effervescent. Uh, church, you know, sort of bubbling up, see, with all kind of inspiration <laughs> and new ideas and all that stuff, see? And the consequence immediately in the order was the order fell apart. Uh, I mean, it just, uh, it used to be priests, brothers, teaching brothers, working brothers, all working in harmony, which, which was, which was unusual. See, in the older orders, you had the priests, and then you had the lay brothers, see? And then you had other orders that were just teaching brothers, see? Well, we, we had all three. But in, in a short time, uh, it all collapsed, and uh, people who, who uh, were priests or wanted to be priests, uh, they'd go off to a diocesan seminary, or they had their work, but uh, people who were just teachers, and especially people who were workers out in the farm, well, they they uh, deserted. They it collapsed. See, so uh, whatever the cardinal had in mind, I mean, the effect on uh, on uh, cradle Catholics and, and religious orders was devastating, absolutely devastating, and and that prompts me now. You know, if, you know, I'm what, 83 now. I've seen a lot of stuff. Uh, to come up with my own definition of the church, and, and it sure is uh, a lot simpler but more to the point. But I don't know if that's jumping the gun. I won't go into what that is now. But anyway, that's my uh, uh, reading on that event of the models of the church. Yeah, this is Al. I, I think uh, the... Um, uh, uh, angst against the institution comes from another source as well, particularly in today's society. It has to do with a misunderstanding of obedience. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, in the world today will have the general attitude, don't tell me what to do. And they see the institution is trying to impose upon them um, obedience to uh, the the priest or the bishop or the deacons or someone in the cl among the clerics. Right. It's, an, it's a misunderstanding that I they're trying to get me to obey a cleric. It, it, that's just not it. It the the obedience is due to God through the church, perhaps, but but the uh, true obedience uh, is is not about the institution. It's really about obedience to the commands of God. Uh, but that's a terrible uh, problem throughout our society in, in, in just about every every uh, aspect of society today. Is this uh, ar it, it's arrogance uh, um, against anyone who wants to suggest that they obey anything. Right. And that, I think, goes back to Rhonda's comment about her... Parents, I've heard more about that, and, and I would just say that, that uh, regardless of what they thought they were, they were, sent, in my mind, anarchists. So, uh, any more comments on the institution? 
Oh, now, I'm wondering, see, I think Bob, you, Bob, and Al, you came into the church later, even though you were familiar with it from your wife and family being Catholics, but um, Bob, uh, Bob and Al, but as you came into it a little later, so you probably were not, weren't familiar as a child with this thing of fear, a fear sort of uh, ridden childhood in the face. So I'm not sure you quite understand the temptation that people had to rebel against this, as in, I happen to be reading, I'm working on this booklet series, Why I Am Still a Catholic, and my friend Amari Armstrong, who is a wonderful daily communicant Catholic now, she described how as a, a little kid, she thought it says you go to hell if you take communion without fasting in those days from midnight till that mass, which say the mass is 8 o'clock in the morning, and you've been fasting since midnight. And this, she drank a cup of glass of water, and she was sure that it was a mortal sin. And then, then she decided to receive communion because she was afraid someone that would notice that she didn't receive communion and think that she was in mortal sin. And then she hesitates going to confession, see, and like this. Now, we can't imagine that really in our time. You know, even the most conservative or militant not conservative, I don't like that word, but militant, tradition-minded Catholic parents would never teach their kids that, that particular type of fear. They teach them fear of hell, of course, but not that kind of, that, that tone of the whole thing, see? And so then the rebellion, that was part of the rebellion of the 70s in the church was reaction against that kind of thing. On the other hand, here I am going to a parish church this morning, one of the few parish churches that still has a school, and they all go to Mass on Sunday morning, on Friday mornings. The whole school turns out for Mass. Now, they no longer have, they, they have order, and people are the different, you know, parents as well as teachers getting their little kids into the right seats and, you know, so on and so forth. So there's no feeling of fear in the church. As a result, the kids are scratching their heads. They're looking up at the ceiling. They're not talking, but they're, you know, sort of totally casual, the songs are being led from the choir in the back of the church. None of the kids is singing. <laughs> See, so we went from a whole pendulum swing where kids associated coming to church with, with fear about the slightest divergence to a situation where everything is casual and pleasant and friendly and no one's paying attention. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah, the pendulum swing. <laughs> uh, hey, Bob, now you haven't said anything, but you're a convert, you're a Catholic, you're a fervent Catholic now. Right. Uh, what, what's your reaction to this lineup of the different types of uh, definitions of the church? You know, does it uh, relevant to you, or did, does it strike you, or... You know, what's what's your reaction to it? Well, uh, I haven't I haven't read uh, read that book, but uh, I kind of wanted to listen a little more before I you know find out a little bit more about some of the other uh, some of the other things before I comment. All okay. right, and how about uh, do we have any other uh, listeners on uh, you know speakers on the line here? Yeah, no, Al again. Al again, uh, we need to move on to the next. Well, Al, Al, yeah, I got yours. What about, is there anyone else's uh, on, on the line today? No, Jim and Katie couldn't come okay, today. Okay, okay, okay. You can move it along, Al, right. 
Thank you, Richard. Uh, church's community was the second on uh, Dave, well, Avery Dulles's list. Church as community, which in itself is a concept that has both strengths and weaknesses. So how about a comment on that one? Church's community. Oh, well, now here the pendulum swing on community is started out is we will experience when we come to Sunday Mass the beautiful sense of community. We will know each other. People, it won't be like in the past where you could go to church for 50 years and not know a single other person's name except the name of the priest because we will have the handshake or, or um, embrace of peace and the coffee hour afterwards so people will can sit around and get to know each other better and we'll have all these activities in the church and so not bingo, instead all sorts of helping hands type of activities in the church and so on and it sounded wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So then what the since hell was no longer being preached by the institutional church called the ruling church, um, the kids, the teenagers didn't think they would go to hell if they missed mass on Sunday. So they said, hey, you know, I experience more community sitting on the beach with my friends and we can say a little prayer. And they stopped going to mass. Right. And to make a pun, en masse, they left the mass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, this Al, there, there was a positive to community. Uh, in, uh, I discovered that uh, shortly after my wife and I married. Uh, she was a lifelong Catholic, and we went back to Seattle to visit. First time I met her family, and uh, I was uh, by then 26, almost 27, had unchurched from the beginning, uh, had no concept of community at all, didn't even, you know, didn't know the word except as a town. And uh, we went to uh, this parish gathering uh, at a little church nearby. And I was, I sat there in total shock for most of the evening. Not only was a crowd there, but they were all happy. I had never seen that. And not only were they happy, but they were talking and laughing and joking, and they were they were friends. And I had never seen that before either. Wow, wow. And uh, it was an utter shock. It was another 11 years before I uh, converted, but uh, that's a whole different story. But the point is, for me, community was a whole new world. And uh, when I didn't, I hardly knew what a church was. And uh, so I, that's my memory of community. But on the other hand, as, as Rhonda pointed out, it, it could give some, many people an excuse to go do their community uh, on the beach or almost anywhere, and pretty soon it's not church at all. It's just a loose community. And, uh, and that is, I guess, the negative side of that. This is Bob, and uh, Richard, you, you got me talking now. Right, Ted. I got a couple of things on community. First of all, there's a very um, um, exuberant movement going on in the church uh, called the Amazing Parish. And uh, one of the participants is a priest in um, Canada, I think it's in Halifax, and he's written a book called Divine Renovation. And um, it, the whole idea there is to build community. And uh, one of the things he does, it's kind of interesting, about once a month, everybody puts on a name tag. And, uh, and then they get to know each other uh, that way so they can pray for each other. Uh, the pastor gets a chance to learn more of the names and so forth. That's one of the things they're doing. I've always taught a thing that if you're really going to have community in the church, uh, I have a plan and where when you come to church, first thing you do, you uh, bless yourself with the holy water, but then you look around and see if there's uh, someone there that uh, has a problem, uh, maybe is, is an, in a walker or has a cane or has got their head on the pew, and you pray for that person, 
and look around the church and find out if there's anybody else like that. And then um, you look around and you see if there's anybody there that you have a difference with. And you make it a point to try to get together with them after Mass and have a reconciliation. And you look and see if there's somebody you don't know. And so you pick out somebody to introduce yourself to at the end of Mass. And the first time I did it, it was amazing because uh, uh, I, I was out, outside the door of the church and I said to this man, I said, are you, um, are you a pa- are you a member here and he kind of <clears throat> uh, 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 he said well I go once in a while and then all of a sudden his wife piped up and she says I want to join your church and so I told <laughs> her our CIA and we got her lined up and uh, and she went through the RCIA program and on Friday the day before um, the Saturday vigil he made an appointment to have a, a com- confession with the priest, and he got back in the church. And his wife came into the church, of course, on Saturday night at the vigil. And then the next year, his daughter uh, joined RCIA. So what I'm saying is that if we're going to have real community in the church, we have to work at it. Oh, that's absolutely beautiful, Bob. And now, if some of you know Bob well and some of you haven't met him yet, he, he actually does this every time he walks into church. He's the friendliest person in the whole church. And I just love being with him. And he's given me a lot of tips on this. I tend to be friendly, relatively friendly, but nothing like Bob. <laughs> I mean, so even though I smile, I don't necessarily walk up to someone and say, I haven't met you before, what is your name, and so on and so forth. And then when he goes to restaurants, when we're saying he always leaves grace for the meal, and then he says to the waitress, is there something we could pray for you about? And then they usually say something they want prayers for, and then afterwards some of them come up and talk to him, and some of them he's actually made friends with or help come back to the church. It's just um, well, suffering so hard. It's, uh, I, you know, people say, use that word community pretty loosely. Cause you, if you're going to have community, you have to work at it. All right, one thing, uh, as, as uh, the, the notion of community uh, was uh, in the order uh, in which I was, uh, you had this tremendous family spirit, and it was real. I mean, we backed each other up. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were priests, brothers, teaching brothers, working brothers. And uh, we usually lived in pretty big houses, uh, running schools and things like that. And what happened, uh, the impact of the spirit of Vatican II or this notion of community <coughs> They said, why, it's too impersonal. You know, it's like uh, you're in the army or something like that. So wh- what you had then is a breakup, an uh, effort to break up the large communities, which had all kind of characters, screwballs, old guys, young guys, middle-aged guys, into smaller communities where, where people were more congenial with each other, more the same age, more, and you had uh, living room liturgies, say. And, and, of course, that broke down the traditional structure, and eventually it just, the, the, this notion of community just broke down the whole order, because uh, why, if, uh, if you have such a, uh, or a, uh, the dark sense or impersonal sense of community, why not have it with the world being in communion with the poor and things like that? Well, the, the order collapsed. Well, and, now, uh, 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 here's what I want to say about that, Richard, is that uh, there's a movement now, too, and uh, John Paul, um, Saint, uh, John Paul II, he proposes that the parish be a community of communities, in other words, just what you guys were doing there is having these meetings in the homes or, you know, they may be calling it uh, home, uh, home church. or uh, And then 
I mean, you're not separate from the parish. You're still a very important part of the parish, but all these different groups get together and have these intimate relationships, but then they, uh, the, the church then becomes a community of communities. We, uh, Bob, we had that in Santa Maria. Uh, I ran retreats where we formed up, uh, while I was there, 16 small prayer communities, if you will, prayer circles that met in homes, yes. uh, you know, with hospitality and prayer and all the rest of it. And that's exactly what it was. It was communities all uh, looking back to the one community, which was the, uh, which was the parish. Now, that's need, community. We, that was community. Uh, we need to move on to the next uh, uh, model of the church, according to Avery Dulles, and that would be church as sacrament, uh, understood as the visible manifestation of the grace of Christ in the human community. Sacrament. Hello? Yes. Okay. Who wants That's to come? Somebody's... What was that? Did you hear music? Yeah, I don't know. There's some interruption there, but it's gone now. Oh, well. No, maybe not. But anyway, let's continue. It's not that bad. Yeah. Church is sacrament. Rhonda, right. were you going to no. say something? Uh, I can't. Um, you guys well, I'm, he- call, I'm hearing call, call Sebastian yeah. talking to someone else. So I, I think someone needs to call Sebastian and find out what's happening. Uh, I'm calling right now. 11, okay. All right, very good. Keep going. Yes, I keep going. Yeah. Right. Well, not, okay, Chuck. Sorry, well, yes, I had a no, little... I wanted, to, uh, I, wanted to make a, I wanted to tell a story related to what um, Richard was saying. Okay, I knew this uh, sister who was a very good friend of mine, and she was living in a large, com- a large community. And... Then they didn't get along, they didn't all agree too well, so like other sisters, she moved into an apartment by herself, and she was feeling this was the right thing to do. She got along better with herself than these other sisters. However, then her old mother got very ill and needed care, and the order had um, had an old age home with wonderful sisters living there taking care of people. And she was just completely turned around by seeing how these sisters who remained with the old institutional model had enough strength among the whole group to take care of these elderly people, whereas she she was a professor, so she couldn't do that in her own house, where she couldn't do that. And then after that, she moved back to the institutional, larger community that she previously lived in. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's uh, that was a discovery. Uh, they found out in these smaller communities they couldn't handle the uh, uh, some of the older people who are retired and all that business. And uh, the only ones who who could were, were people who are pretty well old-fashioned into the uh, bigger bigger sense of uh, if if more impersonal notion. You could look after the uh, old people and the oddballs and all that business. See, so uh, yeah, it, it's uh, well, it put a better look on the so-called impersonal institutional type see right, but that, that's what that was that was a learning curve though and it took a while in the meantime there was the general collapse uh, as church church is sacrament um, it, church is understood as a visible manifestation of the grace of God now, how does that work 
the church itself is, a, is seen as a, as a sacrament. Well, you see, what happened among the priests was, well, here, just to give you an instance, the priests usually would say Mass uh, every day and uh, be either by themselves or with the service or maybe with the community. And then they uh, they did away with that, and then they had all the priests getting together, and they co-celebrated Mass. So you'd have, oh, I guess, ten priests. And uh, some priests felt threatened by it. But uh, you, you, you try to make it a sacrament, but... but uh, it didn't work. It, uh, the... Uh, Something happened deep down. It just it didn't work, and then a lot of priests uh, were isolated, and yet uh, so they'd leave the order, and then they'd go out and be a parish priest. At least they had a job. Now, if you're a teaching brother and the uh, idea of sacrament collapsed, well, you just went out into the world and started teaching and took what community there was. Uh, and the idea of sacrament wasn't so strong. So that's my reading of sacrament. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so trying to visualize the church itself as a sacrament uh, is... Uh, very hard, very hard. hard. It's hard to deal with, right. And, and, it, and I was thinking, well, maybe you think of it as a collective of the actual seven sacraments, and that doesn't, that's a non-starter, too. <laughs> so that doesn't work either. So that is probably maybe one of the weakest of the, uh, of the six models. Uh, the next one is church as a herald, and uh, that's defined as a faithful people who hear the word of God, keep it, and proclaim it in their lives. Church is herald. What's so good and so weak about that? Well, the, the, the effect was that the people who were restless, the younger people and who, who left the order, <coughs> they were out to have solidarity with the poor, uh, neighborhood organizations. Uh, some of them became doctors so you could heal people and lawyers so you could defend them. But it sort of turned out to kind of a sociologist's uh, way of salvation. It's like if you feed people and uh, look after their needs, then they're ready to receive grace. But, but yeah. you do the sociological first. And it then after of, that, you get into the uh, spiritual. Kind of a uh, salvation army approach to uh, yes, church. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. But you don't have to be a celibate religious to, to do that, or, or an ordained priest. Ah, that's huge, that's huge. So if you, well, I kept wondering, see what I did, I never read that book actually years ago. So I looked it up, I Googled the book, and I got this summary of the book, but it's very short. It's only about three pages. So I kept wondering if what he really meant when he got through with it, because with each of these models, this summary lists reasons that are wary, things, red flags about this description to make this the description. So I kept wondering by the end of the book, maybe one of you knows, does he, um, does he say we need all these, aspects of the church instead of seeing them as separate ways of seeing the church. Yeah, Ron, let me answer that one because I ran into this book at uh, Seattle University. It was, uh, one, uh, it was a text in one of our courses. And the, uh, the bottom line of the course and the book was that each of these models has strengths and weaknesses and none of them uh, are a complete statement of what church is collectively in some balance, which is hard to specify, but collectively in, in some balance. The, all the models together 
define what church is. But no model in itself is a complete uh, 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 revelation of what the church is. And oh, that's good. That's what, I, that's what I thought was a possibility, and that I would like to see very much, because each of these images has a partial truth to it. Now, yeah. in, this book, in this book I assembled about five years ago called... Um, um, <laughs> oh, good for me. I'm forgetting the titles of my own books. Okay, Toward a 21st Century Catholic Worldview. And my idea in assembling this book, I have different writers who wrote articles in this book, and Richard was one of them. And um, so, anyway, and uh, we have chapters on different aspects of the church. And the idea was to try to overcome the polarity that comes when we stereotype and ridicule other people in the church, even, even though those people have a partial truth. See? So the fact that Catholics are not pacifists doesn't mean that we shouldn't applaud peacemakers and that we can consider we can be angry zealots and forget about peace because some people are pacifists, see? So in the same way, this way we shouldn't, we shouldn't just uh, write off these different models of the church because of the bad sides of them when they each have a good side. Yeah, it, it, it turns out that the, mo the models, six of them, and there are probably others we could dream up, uh, collectively, uh, it's a very complex process to try to do that in the mind, to collect all that into one summary statement. It's just about as complex as life itself. And the church, there, <laughs> you know, I would suggest, is the church is just about as complex in its total reality. It's just as complex as life because that is life and that is the source, the, the, uh, the conduit, if you will, of eternal life. Right, right. The next, uh, the next model is, oh, I want to comment about Harold, uh, that also would tend to separate people from the community and from the institution because you can go on Harold all by yourself. And there are some people who have done that. They split off and, uh, and uh, a lot of them have formed their own little churches. Um, or at least they're they're out beating the bushes all by themselves, and you run into those that problem too. Uh, it's very oh, okay. But looking looking at now, is that ever positive? I was thrilled by this fact that I heard there was a Pentecostal man, young man, who made up his mind that since Jesus said, "Go out to the whole world and preach for the truth," he would look at the map study the whole world and figure out where they had never heard the name of Jesus. And he went to all these little villages all over the world where they had never heard of Jesus and preached Jesus. Now, that's just astounding, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so I, I think we also have to... Uh, know, what, people, what, what happened to him? What happened to him? Well, he, I mean, he, he succeeded. I mean, he preached it everywhere, and he was very happy. I mean, whether it took deep root there because, they, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what happened to him, but just the thought that he did it <laughs> was just astounding to me and meant a great deal, you know? Yeah, well, so, I'd want to see it extended over time. See, I want to put in <laughs> years, you know, and then then I'll be able to tell because... I've seen a lot of immediately inspirational and astounding things, but the point is, do they last? Do they endure? Are they practical? You know? So well, anyway. that's very true. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So there you need that. You need to come back. You need the institution. You can't just have the herald, in, like these, in terms of this vocabulary here. So that's you need the institution, think, yeah. not just the herald, but you also need heralds, and the whole emphasis now, again, on evangelization, um, 
is because Catholics, many, some Catholics got into this is my church where I get my spiritual food every week and well, I don't need to evangelize because no one's going to hell. Right. Yeah, the, uh, that throws us back to the institution, which, which is really a, a, uh, an umbrella for all the other activities and models uh, that, uh, uh, that sustains over time, uh, while these other models are, uh, are more tuned to the, the present moment but it's the institution that carries you on from from year to year and from century to century. Right. Uh, the next model is church as servant, which is close to the herald idea, I think. In, uh, in short, a redeemed people who have the mandate to establish in the world Christ's kingship of peace, justice, love, and reconciliation. Church is servant. Well, the way it's described in this little summary here is is this this model has inspired church sponsored institutions of charity, servants, hospitals, soup kitchens, sanctuaries, prison chaplaincies, and all of this kind of thing, which is also very good. Mm-hmm. Well, that's why Mother Teresa made quite an impact on me because she. In the order, we were trained to be teachers, and you had priests and, and leaders, see? So you have the idea of people who have something and want to give it to others, to the needy. Now, here's Mother Teresa taking a person half dead off the street, and all she's trying to do is to have him have a peaceful death. So, I mean, you're not adding to the Christian body, although, although it is the church triumphant, but not the church on this earth. And she figured it was worth her life to be that kind of a humble servant, you know, uh, of helping people die right. See? And, uh, and then you get vocations, but not from the ones you're helping, you know, you, and uh, that struck me as how radical this uh, serving is, you know. And, and it struck me very much that God, when he came down to earth, uh, figured his way of saving people was to get himself crucified, see, but then rising from the dead. But that happens in the next world. And, uh, but that, that idea has only occurred to me, oh, years, years later, uh, a servant, uh. Yeah, now, I was, I'm just reading a huge, um, volume of photographs of Mother Teresa, and it's called, by this name, Okay, works of love are works of peace. Oh, okay, it has all these pictures of her with the dying, many more than I would enjoy seeing, actually. Yeah. The, the dying are usually smiling because the sisters and the volunteers are smiling at them and so forth. And, um, however, she always says we're not social workers, we're doing this because we see Jesus in them. They are Jesus suffering and all that kind of spirituality, which is so beautiful. And uh, I remember people saying, well, because of the law in India, she would say, we don't proselytize. We just care for them. But then I heard when she goes around the house of the dying, she asks the sisters, did you give for each person, did you give this person their ticket yet, which which was a code word for baptism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, churches, otherwise, you can't only be interested in helping them with their sufferings, wonderful as that is, to help people who are suffering and in pain, but you also want to give them hope for eternal life. 
Yeah, and I think that it, that is some of the shortcoming of some of the peace and justice people who get very extreme in that direction. The whole idea of church as servant brings up, too, the, the concept of the wounded healer, the person who goes out and tries to heal people based on their own suffering. As, as, and my wife was a good example of that. I'll, just as an example, she was a, an orphan, bounced around from house to house as a child, and uh, she grew up to be a uh, servant of teens in in the jail, uh, incarcerated teens and kids out on the street with no home. And so she ministered to them uh, for many, many years in various uh, town, in various cities, from Seattle to to Southern California to Texas. And uh, that was her life of service, along with. Uh, the sacraments and the community and the herald responsibilities. Yeah, and from what you say, she wasn't coming from a position of strength. She was coming from a position she needed healing and knew what the feeling of helplessness was. And and having that feeling of having been on the bottom or being on the bottom uh, you have a way with people on the bottom. You know, you, uh, well, you, you're sensitive. You, you, you know how to handle it. Uh, if you've yeah. been more prosperous or successful, well, you, you don't have that kind of a touch. Yeah. Yeah, it's been there, done that kind of a thing. You know, so yeah. You know, so how you, you know what the needs are. And I get, I guess in one sense I did the same thing as a as an uh, agnostic for 38 years. When I became converted, I wound up teaching other converts uh, in the RCA and did that for 25 years. Uh, it, it's just a natural thing to want to help those who are suffering what you had suffered before. Mm-hmm. Right, which is different from being a lieutenant colonel with people under you. I like the centurion says, go, and the guy does it. And don't go, and the guy doesn't do it. That's a different experience. It's necessary in life. It's necessary in life, but I mean, hey, it's not the only angle. Right, that's back to the institution, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Church is servant. Uh, the... The very last one is uh, church as seen as a school of discipleship. This church is a school. How is that seen in strengths and weaknesses as a model? Well, I like that one, you know, because I'm a teacher. You know, I've been in school. <laughs> All of you and, like that. and I've been trying to convince people uh, that what I'm going to teach them really is good for them. Well, usually they're a little skeptical or indifferent about how good it is for them. So it's up for me to charm them, uh, con them, bully them, prod them, sweet talk them, you know, and uh, teach them, teach them something. Because you do know something being older. Well, the thing that I've experienced greatly is um, because I was an intellectual convert first. I mean, I, I, was, I studied everything the church taught, and either I agreed with it or I saw that the church has to be the tiebreaker on doctrine, otherwise you have the, the 20,000 denominations. So the Pope has to be the tiebreaker in his infallible teaching and all this kind of thing. But then I became a teacher, and so I was teaching these different truths to people and learning about them and researching them. And I find that these teachings are an enormous help when we fall into a temptation to doubt, I don't think I actually doubt, but I can get into a temptation to doubt if life seems either too painful or too ridiculous. By too ridiculous, I mean, now at 79 years old, I look at the fuss people make about the most trivial things in life, 
And I just have this feeling life is inane the way society is, you know, and things like that. And then I think, who knows, what, you know, how could God stand it? <laughs> yeah. So then I begin a sort of, that sort of train of thinking, and after you think, how could God stand it, then you think, maybe we're not right that God created this universe out of love and that he has a plan of love because it's just too complicated and idiotic the way life is, which after the fall we have all these idiotic things. I mean, to me, some of the, one of the most biggest idiotic things because of my love of simplicity of life and feeding the hungry is the idea that you go into the supermarket and there are ten slightly different brands of the same food. And meanwhile, in another country, people are starving. And according to the stuff I read, the reason they're starving is there used to be all sorts of ways of storing seeds in case there was a famine. But then all this was demolished in order to have farms where you made, you plant, grew asparagus and strawberries for first world countries, that kind of stuff, you know. So because of all that, um, I can get into this feeling of this ridiculousness of the way things are. It's just too evil or in my own life it's too painful. But then what always gets me over those kind of thoughts is I go back to the, what I was taught and what I myself teach and I go back to these basic teachings and then try to put them into my own words in teaching, which are kind of simplistic but stick in people's minds. That, you know, I said it a few times on this program, you know, after all, if you suffered terribly in a concentration camp or a gulag, um, every single day of your life, it would be worth it to gain an eternity of bliss in union with God. Just do the math. <laughs> <laughs> so this school of discipleship is very real to me, that we need to learn the truth and really understand it. And I'm just thrilled that there's so many adult education programs in the parishes, by the way. You know, it used to be it was just for the kids, and there was nothing for the adults in uh, teaching because most of the parishioners had gone to Catholic school through high school. They had all those years of Catholic teaching, so they didn't need classes in the parishes, but now where there's so little, so few Catholics go to Catholic schools, they really need adult teaching. There's another way that that virtually everyone can teach as well, and uh, uh, not so much as by lecture, as uh, which is critically important, but but by what they do and what they don't do. Uh, uh, and that is to simply affirm others that they run into in church and elsewhere. Uh, Rhonda saw this because uh, we were we went to we go to mass together on Sunday, and she saw this. This little kid came and plopped down next to me. He was late, I guess. Uh, he, you know, he came running in late, and he sat down on my left. Uh, he was a young boy, maybe 12, something like that. He plopped down, and I, and I turned, and I extended my hand, shook his hand, and said, thank I'm so glad you're here. And I affirmed this kid, and he was in utter shock that an adult would even talk to him, much yeah. less affirm his, much less <laughs> affirm his presence. You remember that, Rhonda? And, yes, uh, yes. And and the other thing I do from time to time when the children's choir sings, which is generally once a month, uh, I've on occasion gone over there and uh, and congratulated each one of the children as the mass after the mass ends and their choir director as well, who's a young woman who has a beautiful voice and sings soprano. I told her one time, I said, your voice soars over the over the uh, church just like the dove soared over the <laughs> River Jordan. <laughs> Something like that, I said. And, yeah, yeah. And she, and she, she, I think she probably grinned for the rest of the day <laughs> over that. Yeah. Such a simple, yeah. simple thing. 
that is a teaching. That is a teaching, and it uh, it just takes no energy at all to do something like that. It all it takes is loving unconditionally. Yeah, I think the, as we look at these all these models, the big thing in all of these is the the, the emphasis has to be on love because that yeah, has, that starts first, and then everything becomes much easier when when someone knows that you really love them, mm. you know, that you really care about them. So now, that's how the much line. How, go ahead. How much time is left? Uh, we're just about done. What's up, Richard? Well, we, I, I, I'd like to take a crack at giving uh, an image that uh, is the right image. Yes, go, go. All right. Uh, well, first of all, uh, except for the Blessed Virgin in Christ, we're all sheep in the flock. All right, so we're all sheep. Yep. And not very smart sheep, where, as the Hail Mary says, we're sinners. So Mary and Christ there to pray for us, or pray for us sinners. All right, now, among the sinners, you have then the uh, Pope, Cardinals, Bishops, but they're sheep, they're sinful sheep, but they happen to be Popes or Cardinals. And then you have married people and single people. And... Uh, and, and, and they have what you call a certain fear of the Lord because these sheep uh, could either, through silliness, get caught by the wolves or become wolves themselves. So there's a fear of the Lord. You could end up in hell so you, if, you, uh, if you don't behave. So you don't want to end up in hell. You want to go to heaven. So there's a certain fear of the Lord. And then you realize that the Lord puts up with your inadequate service. You're, a, a, you're an unprofitable servant, say. And then, and then you love God for being so mindful of you. But it isn't like you lead off with love. No, no. We, we, end, uh, we start usually with love of ourselves. And uh, you finally get the idea we're not so hot that uh, we don't do the things we should do. And uh, God will help us. And uh, so that, that's, that's my uh, image, just one. Say one image, and then you can look at it, but it, it applies to everybody. Okay, let's call it the church of the sheepfold. All right, that's a good one, the sheep. <laughs> that's yeah. a good one. Oh, Richard, this solves every problem because... You will finish faster the book on Newman if you have the next book in your mind. So why isn't your next book after the Newman be the church as sheepfold? Well, because the Newman book is sheepfold. You know, it's one of the sheep <laughs> at 83 years old saying, hey, what I've seen, you know. Yeah, but and, that and one is a little harder to read. The sheepfold one I know, is because really I'm right popular up. level. Popular I'm writing level. for sheep who've gone to college. Now, people who go to college are hard cases, see? So you've got to <laughs> plow through Newman's distinctions and so on. But it all ends up, my father and mother from the west of Ireland were right. They put the right stamp on me, see? Uh, and when I got educated, uh, you know, the problem is to hold on to that stamp of being a sheep. Well, if you're an honest enough, you get beaten down enough, then you cry out like any other dumb sheep for help, see? And then the church, with its authority and guidance, looks good. Looks good. Yeah, this is Al. I'm going to have to put the stamp on the program. Uh, next week, next our next session, uh, we'll be talking about our own personal memories of our greatest spiritual or religious moment. The panel will be sharing their most memorable spiritual and religious moment. And that's our next program. Okay, and so, Bob, and back next, to you. Next week, uh, we will be, um, the, the next time we get together, we'll be live. So we won't be getting together next week because this program will air next week. And then we'll get together the following week, and we'll be live, and we'll be taking calls, and, you know, we'll, we'll try to work that out and get some other comments, okay? Right. Okay. So we'll see you uh, in two weeks. 
as far as the panel is concerned, the rest of you, uh, we'll see you next week, same time, same station, on the open door. In the meantime, may God bless each and every one of you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, leaders. Good show. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.